I'm assuming you have watched the first video, so you know that this series of videos will be about this theory of quantum electrodynamics. Rest assured, you don't have to know about those fancy mathematics for this video. Yet before we dig in the subject, I'd like to take some time to briefly talk about some history. About a century ago, people started questioning what matter is, eventually they proposed a theory to include a heavy nucleus with electrons going around it. Yet using the mechanical laws of Newton to predict the motion of electron turned out to be a huge failure. All kinds of prediction came out to be wrong. Incidentally, the theory of special relativity, which you perceive as a great discovery, came out at the same period of time. But compared with the discovery that Newton's law failed at the atomic level, it appeared only as a minor modification. Because the phenomena at the atomic level is so weird, it took a long time to develop another system, which is later called quantum mechanics. The word quantum refers to this peculiar sense that nature goes against common sense. Quantum mechanics predicts all phenomena, like how oxygen combines with hydrogen to form water, so it was a really successful theory. But this theory didn't actually include phenomena like electromagnetism, so we had to modify Maxwell's equations to fit in the framework of quantum mechanics. And from there, QED was developed. In 1928, Dirac made a relativistic theory about the interaction of electron, and his theory said electron had a magnetic moment, which you can imagine as tiny baby magnets inside the electrons. And in certain units, its value is exactly 1. In 1948, it was discovered that the value is closer to 1.00118. It was known that electrons interact with light, so small corrections were expected. Yet as we go and calculate, we get infinity, which is of course wrong. In the same year, Feynman, Schwinger and Tomonaga tackled this problem and they got a value near 1.00116 which tells us our theory might not be so wrong. This is the theory of quantum electrodynamics. I ought to impress you by giving you some recent numbers to look at. To this day, experiments have electrons magnetic moment at this pile of number, with the numbers in brackets uncertain, while our theory puts it at this another pile of number. If you would notice, this is really accurate. Yet this is only one example of the vast numbers I can choose to show you. These numbers are here to intimidate you into believing QED is indeed a correct theory of nature. QED explains every phenomena of the physical world with the exception of gravity and radioactivity. Yet however good this theory is, we can only say about how nature works but not why it works in this way. Come on, nobody knows. Only God knows. If you ever send an email to him and get an answer, please tell me. What I've done is to put you in the right mood for this story, and now we're ready to go. We start our story with Newton. In the late 1600s, Newton was playing with light. He first noticed that light can be separated into different colors. One word about light. When we mention light in these videos, I don't only mean the visible light from red to purple. It turns out the scale of light can be described by a number called wavelength. If we increase the number, we get microwaves, radio waves, etc. We can also decrease the wavelength and go the other way, where we get UV, X-rays and gamma rays. For the following videos, we will use yellow light as an example, but everything we say naturally extends to this whole scale. Newton thought light was made up of particles, which he called corpuscles, and he was partly correct. We now call them photons, which comes from the Greek word for light. We know Newton is correct because we can measure light with a very sensible device, the photomultiplier, that makes clicks when light shines on it. And when light gets dimmer, the clicks are the same loudness, only there are fewer of them. Thus light is like raindrops. There are a lot of raindrops, but never half a raindrop. You might wonder how we are able to detect a single photon, and it's simple. I'd love to take a moment to explain it to you. When a photon hits a metal plate, it knocks an electron out the atom. 
It is then attracted to another positively charged plate, knocking out three or four electrons. They are further attracted to knock out more electrons. This repeats until millions of electrons come together and produce a current large enough to be amplified through an amplifier, making the audio sound of uniform loudness. It is very important to know that light comes in particles, especially for those of you who went to school and got told that light behaves like waves. The truth is, it behaves like both. I would personally love to invent a new word and call them wavicles, but the community has decided to call it wave-particle duality, and we have to live with it. I believe you are familiar with the phenomenon that light is partly reflected by glass. When light shines on glass. Some of it gets reflected, while some get transmitted. Now I'm going to tell you about an experiment, and tell you its surprising results. In this experiment, we have a light source that spits only yellow light, and we place a photomultiplier A to catch any photons that get reflected. I have to tell you about a simplification I'm making. In this experiment, I am assuming light only reflects off the surface of glass. In reality. It reacts with the millions of atoms inside the glass. The net result of which is equal to being reflected by the surface. Anyways, we put another photomultiplier B into the glass to catch any photons that got through the glass. What are the results of this experiment? For the 100 photons that got shot towards the glass, an average of 4% arrive at A. While the 96% others got transmitted through the glass to B, we already face a big trouble. If light are particles, how can light be partly reflected from the surface? Each photon must end up at either A or B. How do they make up their mind whether to go to A or B? Newton was faced with this great difficulty. One theory of his is this: 96% of the glass is made up of holes. Where photons can go through, while four percent is made of spots where photons get stuck. This is largely incorrect, as we shall see in minutes. In fact, several attempts have been made to understand this phenomenon, but none succeeded. The same experiment is run millions of times, and the results are all different. Einstein said, "Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and then expecting different results." It seems that we, including nature herself, are indeed insane. While this partial reflection phenomena is weird, I shall tell you the results when light can reflect off two surfaces, which is mad and mind-boggling. Let me show you why. This time we place B under the sheet of glass, so now photons can reflect from either the front surface or the back surface to end up at A. Otherwise, it will go to B. Normal people would think that since the front surface reflects 4% of the light, so the back surface also reflects 4% of the light, so 8% go to A while 92% go to B. But let's see what insane nature has to say. With some sheets of glass, we do get 8% of the light reflected, but with other sheets of glass with different thickness, sometimes we get 16%, twice our expected results. With some pieces of glass with the right thickness, no light is reflected. 100% end up at B. Shocking. To test the dependence of partial reflection on thickness, we start with the thinnest possible glass, then slowly increase its thickness. With the thinnest possible glass, nearly all photons end up at B. Occasionally, one or two photons hit A. As we increase the thickness. The reflection slowly grows towards 8%. We further increase the thickness of the glass, and now the reflected portion goes all the way up to 16%. Then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose, and the portion goes all the way down, past 8%, then to 0%. If the glass has just the right thickness, there is no reflection. We can plot the reflection with respect to the thickness. And what we get is a wavy structure oscillating back and forth between zero and sixteen percent. Up to this point, the hole and spot theory is pretty much screwed. I mean, try it with holes. 
Today, with lasers that shoot monochromatic light, we see this effect continues even for glass that is 50 meters thick. We rarely see this phenomenon in daily life because light mostly come in mixtures of colors but not monochromatic. But how can we explain this weird feature of light? With the right thickness, reflection is turned off, while other thickness amplifies the result to twice the value we'd expect. To this day, we still don't have a good theory for partial reflection. Theoretical physics has basically given up on that. The theory of quantum electrodynamics resorts to calculating probabilities, and though it predicts things correctly, we still don't know how photons decide where to go. That is unknown. Now, I'll tell you how we calculate the probabilities, which is the thing that physicists do. And it is deceptively simple. We just draw little arrows on a piece of paper. Now what do arrows have to do with probability? There's a rule from quantum mechanics, the probability of an event is equal to the square of the length of the arrow. The probability that photons arrive at A is 4%, so the length of this arrow is 0.2, since 0.2 squared is 0.04. In the second experiment, photons either bounce from the front surface or the back surface to end up at A, and the probability ranges from 0 to 16%, hence the arrow must range from 0 to 0.4. It is obvious that one single arrow cannot do the job. We start by considering various ways a photon could end up at A. Since we assumed that light reflects from either the front surface or the back surface, there are two ways a photon could get to A. For each of these possibilities, we associate an arrow. In this case, there are two possible ways, so we draw two arrows, then combine them to a final arrow, whose square is the probability of the event. Now how do we combine arrows? We put the start of the second arrow to the end of the first one, and draw the final arrow from the start of the first arrow to the end of the second arrow. Technically, this is called adding arrows, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Each arrow has a length and orientation, and the way to determine them is simple. For the length, each surface can reflect about 4% of the light, so both of these arrows have length 0.2. To determine the direction of each arrow, we imagine we have stopwatch that times a photon as it moves. This imaginary stopwatch turns about 500 billion times per second for yellow light. But since the human eye is not made to see arrows rotate 500 billion times a second, we slow down the rotation in our simulation to one cycle per second. When the photon starts at the source, we start the watch, and as it ends up at the photomultiplier, we stop the watch. The direction in which the stopwatch is pointing is the direction of the arrow. Now, let us run the simulation for the back arrow and see what happens. We notice the reflection from back surface requires just a little bit more time than that of the front arrow because it has to go through the very thin layer of glass. Hence, it also turns a bit more than the other arrow. We need one more rule to compute a correct answer. When we consider reflection from a front surface, that is, from air back to air, we reverse the direction of the arrow. Now we combine the two arrows. The final arrow has a length of nearly zero, since the two arrows cancel each other out. Thus, the probability of light reflecting from a very thin layer of glass is effectively near zero. Remember, the probability is the square of the final arrow's length. If we use a thicker glass instead, the front reflection arrow has the same direction as before, since it goes through the same distance, but the photon bouncing on the back surface requires more time to go through the glass, so the imaginary stopwatch rotates more than before, now making a 90 degree angle to the front arrow. The length of the final arrow is now precisely the square root of 8, which is approximated as 0.3 here, and the probability is 8%. We increase the thickness further, so the back arrow is precisely opposite the direction of the front arrow. The length of the two arrows is twice 0.2, which is 0.4, making the probability 16%. When the thickness increases again, the arrow keeps turning, thus the back arrow makes a greater turn, sending the probability back 
through 8% to 0% when the back arrow makes a full turn, and the cycle repeats itself. I've shown you how this strange feature of partial reflection can be calculated using rotating arrows. The technical term for these arrows are probability amplitudes. Before we end, I'd like to show you why you'd see colors in a soap bubble, or why when you have oil puddles underground, you see beautiful colors on the surface. The thin layer of oil is really like a layer of glass. It reflects light from zero to a maximum, depending on its thickness. If we shine sunlight onto the oil, which is a mixture of red, green, and blue, we see some areas with the right thickness strongly reflect red only, while some other areas reflect only blue and green. Where the amplitudes of all colors cancel each other, we see black, since no light is reflected. It is also easy to explain the different colors that emerge. Where both red and blue are reflected, our eyes perceive it as violet. The areas that strongly reflect both blue and green give the impression of yellow. This argument generalizes to all colors since they are all mixtures of red, green, and blue in different portions. You can notice the areas that appear blue are much more than the areas that appear red. Why is this the case? To understand this better, we have to know that the 16% cycle repeats faster for blue light than red light, so their intensities don't overlap. The cycles repeat differently because the stopwatch turns faster for a blue photon than a red photon. In fact, this is the only difference between a red and blue photon. This makes it more likely for blue photons to be reflected off the oil stain, as is clear from the frequent peaks that a blue photon makes and thereby, more blue is reflected than red. This graph also makes it clear which thickness gives rise to red, blue, violet, or black. We can easily add the graph for a green photon here and give more discussion, but we've got limited time, so I'm not doing it here. For now, I think this kind of wraps it up. For the next video, we will further demonstrate how this principle of light makes up different phenomena and we will also run through a number of simulations which in my mind are extremely satisfying to watch. See you then!